Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I worked so hard for so many years, and now that I'm nearly 35, I've got this crazy nickname. Unbelievable. I hope you've enjoyed the, the conference so far. I hope you enjoyed the day yesterday, the fantastic gala dinner at Coca-Cola. I obviously had a great evening. <laughs> so I can't even talk. And I can't even dance, as you all noticed last night at, at the Afterglow. And I think we got off to a great start this morning. Uh, primarily because of some amazing pictures of me. Uh, but also the session was good, which is also important. Uh, looking at big data and looking how the industry is going to change. So that was a great start to the conference. And we've still got you know, a full day ahead. After the lunch, we're going to have the think tanks, which have become one of the most popular parts of our conference, where we get together in smaller groups to look at different issues that affect, that affect our industry and enable kind of more intimate conversations, uh, perhaps more honest conversations rather than when you're in a big group and really share some of the issues that you face. So please make sure you're around for the think tanks. And we've got, a, we've got an amazing final panel session uh, at the end with Honda, Volkswagen, Fiat Chrysler, Ford and Ryder sharing, sharing their, some of their uh, opinions, some of their visions, some of their strategies for the future. So don't plan on leaving early because we've got a great afternoon still to come. But this is, one, again, another important session, another important topic, and we're looking at the supplier supply chain. More and more of the responsibility for the supply chain is being passed on to the suppliers, but perhaps with less assets, with less uh, budgets, smaller budgets, smaller teams to handle this responsibility that's being passed on and the, the supply chains are getting longer and longer. So this is a very important session. And again, we've been very fortunate to put, put together a great session featuring a uh, car maker, uh, a couple of tier suppliers, and a logistics service provider. So I think, again, we'll hear some very important information on what they're doing and what they're doing differently to, to support our industry. The first presentation of the day will be a joint presentation uh, featuring Paolo Montero and, uh, from Volkswagen Group of America. But I will say in advance that if he says anything about my trip in Brazil last week, week or any stories that you, that you might hear from him about what I was up to last week, they're all false. I'd just like to say that in advance. Not least because this is live streamed and my wife might be watching. <laughs> Hello, darling. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to welcome to the podium Paolo Montero, Inbound Logistics Manager from Volkswagen Group of, of America, and Adam Pruitt, the Production and Logistics Manager from Chattanooga Seating Systems, part of Magna Seating. Thank you very much, Paolo. Thank you, Louis. So first off, I would like to um, share with you that I'm on the US only for three years now. So although I had some success in managing the supply chain, I still struggle with my English accent. Um, I think you guys would apologize me considering that Louis is doing this for 12 years and he still has his uh, really strange accent. <laughs> so uh, today uh, we were invited to speak a bit about our supplier supply chain, but before we go, uh, in deep in that discussion, I would like to share with you some of the facts uh, from our company um, and Volkswagen. Volkswagen is, of course, a huge group. is one of the biggest uh, automotive manufacturers in the world, um, and uh, we intend to keep our grow and to. Um, maintain this objective. Of course, it's not important only to increase our production sites. Currently, Volkswagen has 119 production sites on the world. As you can see on the upper part of the slide, most of our plants are, of course, uh, located in Europe, uh, mostly in Germany. Um, I think that the best plant is uh, the one located in Portugal, but this is a personal opinion. Um, on the North America continent, you see that we have uh, currently a plant in Chattanooga, but we already have three plants in Mexico, being one of them, uh, just a recent plant for Audi. This plant is going to supply products for the North America region. 
We have, of course, for a long time a strong pr presence in China with uh, 20 plants already, and we are continuing to grow on that area of the world. So, about Chattanooga, uh, some facts and figures. A um, couple of years ago, there was a huge crisis here on the US, and uh, some of the big three struggle, some have to do downsizing, at, and at the time, in, in contra cycle, I would say, Volkswagen took the decision of uh, choosing Chattanooga to open uh, or reopen a plant location on the US. And we invested here on the US in Chattanooga over $1 billion. Um, we have installed a plant with capacity to uh, produce over 150,000 vehicles per year. And our markets are, of course, the North America market, but also some um, uh, AGCC markets. We employ currently about 2,400 people. Some uh, interesting curiosity is that uh, our plant uh, here in Chattanooga is the uh, only lead platinum certified car plant in the world. Um, currently, we, we produce the Passat, um, which is known as uh, one of the cars in the market with the biggest space for the passengers, I would say. We have just recently made a facelift where we incorporated a lot of technology um, on our product. And currently, I would say today and two days ago, we started to produce our first prototypes of the new mid-sized uh, BSUV that we are going to produce in the plant uh, from December um, of this year onwards. To accommodate this grow, the plant is almost doubling its size. And uh, you can see on the upper uh, left corner of the slides the areas that we reserved for the logistics um, area. But whenever we talk about grow, we have to take in consideration the supply chain grow. And on this slide, you can see um, where most of our suppliers are located. So we have approximately 87% of our volume of transportation source here on North America. Uh, we bring about 6% of our volume from Mexico, and we still bring about 7% from overseas. Um, I'm responsible for the complete supply chain, meaning the procurement of all uh, the materials for production together with the, the transportation for these materials. Um, on these slides, we can see currently the a dis a distribution of our volumes. Um, and uh, you can see that 45% um, is related to our uh, body shop parts and about 42% for our assembly parts. So in total, um, more over than 87% uh, um, came from or our source on the US. Um, these are some of our G's commodities. So on our supplier park, we have um, been installing a couple of suppliers that um, um, supply directly to us on um, JIT G concept, which for sure everybody is aware on this room. And the fact that uh, um, we have been uh, challenged, I would say, by our purchasing colleagues. Um, the struggle to reduce costs and prices also in material have extended tremendously our um, link of our supply chain. So currently, as you, you will realize on the discussion we are going to have uh, in a few minutes, we have some cases of parts that I would say they make uh, tourism of uh, several thousand miles before they reach the, the final uh, destination to be assembled. So this, of course, becomes a challenge. All of these GIS um, commodities that you see on the board, before they are delivered just in sequence into the customer, in this case to Volkswagen, they have all of them a very complex supply chain behind. Some of these um, second years and third years are what we 
known in the industry as mandated suppliers. So it's the OAM that makes the selection and the contracts with them. But some of them are, of course, the responsibility of the first years themselves. So coming to the point now that we have made some introduction about our structure, about our growth here uh, on the US, um, I would like now to call into the stage Adam. Adam is uh, the production and logistics manager uh, for CSS, uh, a company from the Magna Group. And um, together we are going to make a very informal discussion about um, not a very big secret. In the supply chain industry, there are not too many secrets to unveil. And when I see the accumulation of uh, people with 20, 30 years um, on, on this um, room, there is not too much thing that really can um, teach about this specific topic. However, I have to emphasize that in this industry, especially in, on the automotive industry, there are two schools how to manage the second and the third years. We have the old school, and you may, some of you may re recognize, the supplier is yours, you take care about your problems because I buy the seat, so I care less how you manage it, okay? Okay. Take care about your own problems. <laughs> what, you never heard about this before? <laughs> okay. I think as bigger the organization is, bigger is the strength to, it's your supplier, you take care about it, okay? But at Volkswagen, this is not the way we, we like to treat our partners. So our approach is, as referred on the slide, engagement. And by engagement, we really talk about active engagement. Um, we believe that the, the success of managing proactively the supply chain with transparency and with collaboration really results. And we have together identified three main topics that have been discussed on, on the last two days on this conference. Um, the first one, to manage appropriately a supply chain, we need to have resources that are effective. What do we mean by this, Adam? Basically, we mean that uh, Volkswagen has resources and Chattanooga Seating has resources, right? But when times of potential crisis or potential disruptions, we must work together to use those resources appropriately. Sometimes resources do not work well together. So there have been cases when not only Magna Seating has made resources changes, also Volkswagen has made resources changes to make sure that we work collaboratively together. Correct. Um, the second point um, that we believe it's important to manage uh, or to help to manage um, not only um, the transparent communication, this is common sense. Again, we should not invent the wheel. But we, we've seen, I have about 20 years of experience on this industry, that a lot of times instead of transparency, we try to hide the issues up to the last moment. We try to resolve the problems ourselves inside of our own organizations, and we then share the issue until the last minute. And you know what? Sometimes cost a couple of thousand dollars or a couple of millions. Um, so transparent communication, that uh, sharing, and having the right resources, although are very simple um, ingredients, really contribute to the success of managing uh, the supply chain. About management tools, uh, do you like to share with us some of the common efforts that we did in sharing some tools? Yes, so in the beginning, we never made any of those mistakes, correct? I, I don't remember, <laughs> honestly. Okay, all right. So, maybe a couple of mistakes were made. And so, jointly, we started working together to come up with a couple of tools here that would help both of us, I would say, sleep at night, mm -hmm. correct? So, we came up with uh, the first one there, which is a coverage confirmation report. 
It's not dictated by the OEM that we needed to do this. It was more of a, do you know what you have? How much do you have? And can you make decisions on, based off of reporting points from the customer, allowing us to make decisions on expediting something or you know, whether we have to fly apart or whether we can truck it. We were allowed to make those decisions based off of the data that we received at multiple points, put it into this report that we created ourselves, and make that decision without having to second guess ourselves. And both of us trusting each other that it was the right decision because we had the data available to us. Next one. So, just for clarification, I, I, I feel that I need to translate part of this thing <laughs> um, on my own English. Um, a lot of times, on the OEMs, they make available multi-point, read, multi-reading points through the production line. And some of the first years do not utilize the full available information that is out there. So two to three years ago, before we started this project together, not only with CSS, but with all the located suppliers in the supplier park, most of them were using only the M100 signal, right? When the customer sends you the requests to produce in sequence. There are other available signals through the completely production line that allows you to manage the information and therefore a lot of time save a lot of money, right? Right, correct. Um, inventory management. Did yes. we work together on this point? Yes, we did. Okay. So our facility is a very small facility. Uh, we are about 58,000 square feet. Um, where Paulo showed the slide earlier about 87% of coming from North America to them, where our supply chain is a lot longer. I would say about 87% of our parts come from Mexico. So we had to set a level that we were comfortable with, knowing the transportation, knowing that we always had trucks en route. We set those levels together, which also flows into this coverage confirmation report, so that we both know if there was a disruption, we can see when the next truck's going to arrive, how much inventory we have every single day, and we're transparent to them. They see the same report that we create. So what happens when, not this, that this ever happens, but let's imagine that you have a delay on the track and you are below this inventory. What happens next? So the next step is to uh, submit a problem countermeasure sheet that would show the information, show the data of how much we have on hand. We send it over to our Volkswagen colleague. We then have a phone conversation together to discuss what are all the next points. So when do we actually run out? Did we look at the M100? Did we look at the R100? Have you gone out and counted the parts? So all your standard practices that you normally would do, those proceed after we know of the issue and then we start to work together. So obviously multiple things can arise during those things that we didn't intend on. The truck that may have broke down didn't arrive, maybe the next step is, is that we can't get another truck there in time. So we start going through all the different scenarios. With VW's help, there may have to be an ensuing um, conference call with the tier two supplier. Because maybe they don't want to produce extra material because it's going to cost overtime. And it wasn't their fault because we're the ones that's responsible for the transportation, right? So with the help of VW and the collaboration between tier one, tier two, we're able to work out how to get the material there and not disrupt not only CSS, but Volkswagen. I I want you guys to understand the following. This has to really work both ways. It's not them being babysitted by the OEM. It's that if there's something that we can do by changing our sequence momentarily or by retaining some vehicles to prevent to have missing parts or to have a potential line stoppage, we will, of course, going to work with them and we will support them. Um, 
We will because, again, the information is shared in advance, in time, and allow us to do risk management. Because, after all, supply chain is basically risk management. So the last process of best practice that we share with CSS was our change management process. Um, Chattanooga is a very recent plant, although we have some experienced people on board. The first years were very tough in change managing process. Uh, we have struggled with a couple situations where the res final result of obsolete material was far from being what uh, we expected. So we went deep with our resources, with our benchmarking inside of the Volkswagen Group, and we developed a change man management process that became extremely efficient. Last model year, model year 16, we have an outstanding result. So we, just, we could have kept it just for ourselves, but we took the decision to share it with our supplier park. So did you guys use it? Yes, yes. So we, we accepted the, uh, the management tool there and implemented the process at our facility to, when a change is coming, is communicated by VW during a series of meetings. We then start a series of uh, cycle counts, as you would call, making sure what we have on hand, making sure that our accurate inventory is there, usually 16 to 20 weeks ahead of time. So that way, we're both on the same page. We then start providing that information back to our VW planner, who would then look at it with us to make sure that the releases that we are seeing each week do not change, um, that it stays constant, and that once we get to the end of production, that we have minimized the amount of inventory that not only we have, but it minimizes the cost for us. Again, simple practices, no big deal but um, uh, the proof that by sharing information and by sharing transparency, we can both get excellent results in managing the supply chain. Um, the last slide that we want to share with you guys is related to the co-management whenever there are disruptions on the supply chain that are detected. Uh, Adam already started to unveil a little bit uh, one specific situation we had to deal together a couple of uh, months ago, but um, I will just ask your attention to the lower part of this slide. So our first year, the seed supplier is located in Chattanooga, the trim supplier is located in Mexico, and the, the, the third year, uh, one of them, the leather supplier is located in Argentina, and the vinyl supplier is located in Canada. So how many miles? That's probably four or 5,000 miles between the, uh, between the length of the tier supply chain. So, so can you share with us one example where we manage or yes. we co-management uh, risk situation? Yes, so we were in a situation to where a quality non-conformance was found on not only one part, but multiple trim covers that we would apply to the seats. Um, the material at CSS was suspect, the material at the uh, tier two was suspect, tier three was suspect. So obviously dealing with leather, it's a natural, um, natural component, right? It comes from a cow. So you can't just um, go out and- a, a big cow. A big cow, yes, yes. <laughs> Multiple cows, right? So when you have a quality issue and you have inventory all through the pipeline, you've got to start from the beginning. You've got to start from the cow. Where was the defect coming from, right? So I learned a lot about cows, right? Over the series of weeks, as we were having conversations between tier two, tier three, along with VW on these conference calls, you learn a lot more than you expect to being in supply chain. You don't think they're going to be learning about these things, but you do. And we do it in evenings normally, right? Evenings so that... Uh, yes, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock 10, 11, 12 o'clock yes. at night, yes. right? It's so yes, we work through it together, no disruptions, and we're able to replace all inventory um, with the help of not only the logistics side at VW, but also the quality side to 
get an acceptable product and replace it through the supply chain all through the tiers by working collaboratively. Okay, so again, this was a, a big challenge. All the supply chain was contaminated. And for sure, most of you uh, with experience on supply chain already passed for, through similar situations. Uh, one approach normally is to get the commercial departments involved on this topic and making pressure through that avenue. The fact is, normally it's the logistics guys that in the end of the day have to resolve the problem. Correct. So um, the co-management really is an important tool to manage the supply chain of our second and third tier suppliers too. Adam, thank you so much for your participation. Thank you, Paulo. Um, I would like to, since I uh, had opportunity to be here, to uh, make a, a, two more comments. First of, part of the success in managing our own supply chain has to do, of course, with some of our partners, okay? And I'm very glad to see that today we have here some of uh, the partners that we are, we are using for, uh, I would say, three, four, five years here in Volkswagen, and some of them for over 20 years uh, abroad, okay? The first partner we use is Schnellike. Schnellike has been a reliable partner for us. Of course, we always consider them expensive, you may understand. But the, the fact, there is always a space for improvement, I would say. But the fact is, part of our managing our internal operation without disruptions come by selecting the correct partners. On the transportation side, we work together with Ryder. Ryder is the main sponsor for this event. I was not paid to do this um, comment right now, but the fact is Darcy has been, I would say, wise enough to keep the relationship uh, together with Volkswagen. Um, we have very reliable service with our partners. We work also with other companies. We developed local companies. Basically, we change our business model from, uh, I would say, a very common business model on the US where the 3PL acts as responsible for all the transportation or as the lead. We kind of broken our um, supply chain in small pieces and we have awarded it separately. It made more sense to us and the truth is we have efficiency and we save about 20% of costs on the last um, three years. So overall, Part of the success in managing of our supply chain relies also on the quality of the partners that we pick. Um, last but not least, um, I was very embarrassed yesterday evening uh, because uh, one of our uh, representatives from our free PL was up here saying basically that Volkswagen is afraid of drones. <laughs> right, Harry? What were exactly what your words? So um, this was not on my original presentation, but we decided to bring the father of the drones. <laughs> this is a concept that we are using and testing in Wolfsburg. Uh, yes, on the US, we are also working with the local authorities uh, because there are regulations that have to be met currently. But uh, Volkswagen is also one step uh, forward in terms of developing new technologies. And this one that you can see over here, it can pick 50 pounds. So bring Amazon or any others and we can um, have a, a short conversation. We are working with other partners on other technologies. I didn't saw very much discussed here um, on these last two days, like the VGV vehicles, which currently are becoming affordable, I would say. We work with Google Glasses. I think it's only the 10th time we speak about Google Glasses here. But this is an example of how we are trying to progress into the future. We don't, we don't waste our money, and any new technology has to be a business case. If it's not a business case, really doesn't matter. So thank you for uh, your attention. That's really good. Thank you very much, Paolo and, and Adam.
a very good presentation, interesting, uh, and I, I quite like the format. Uh, that was uh, very good and gave us an example of a real relationship, uh, a partnership approach between, uh, between suppliers. Next up to hear from a, another, another tier supplier and to hear their, their logistics challenges, I'd like to welcome to the podium John Godfrey, the Vice President of Logistics for Pirelli. Morning. Let me give you an introduction to uh, Pirelli Tire, especially here in the uh, NAFTA region. So a little bit about our company. First of all, we're the, uh, uh, we're the leading uh, manufacturer of high-end tires uh, for premium vehicles. Uh, we were founded in 1872. Uh, we're the fifth largest tire manufacturer in the world. Uh, we have 20 factories around the world supplying to original equipment manufacturers. Um, we uh, have about 20% market share on the premium vehicles in the world and about 50% market share on the prestige vehicles uh, in the world. Uh, we're also known for our, our uh, supply of Formula One uh, tires to that racing series. Uh, we're about a $6 billion company. Uh, if you look at uh, where our resources are, uh, we are a European company. Um, so we have a lot of, uh, of our employees manufacturing in Europe and then also in Latin America. As you can see, NAFTA represents a much smaller percentage. This is our fastest growing uh, market in the world for us right now. A little bit about where our factories are. Uh, like I said, uh, we were uh, founded in Italy, so you see a lot of our presence, uh, manufacturing presence there in UK, Italy, Germany. Romania. Um, we also uh, have a factory here in Rome, Georgia, about an hour and a half uh, north of Atlanta here. And uh, we also have a factory in Silao, Guanajuato, uh, Mexico. Uh, our business is divided into two parts, uh, and actually into two separate companies. Uh, we have our consumer business, which is supplying to uh, passenger cars and uh, motorcycles. Um, it is... Uh, uh, um, uh, this is what we're probably known for. Um, you, uh, we're supplying to different uh, original equipment manufacturers. Then on the industrial side, these are truck tires, agro tires. Uh, we have about a, um, a, uh, a, a six million unit capacity there on the industrial side. Uh, some of the innovations that we're known for in our product. Uh, we have uh, run-flat tires. These are tires that uh, have a sidewall that's capable of supporting the tire uh, even when there's a puncture. Uh, we also have something that we're developing called seal inside. Um, same thing, uh, when there's a puncture in the tire, except in this case, there's a compound that fills the hole uh, there where the puncture is, allowing the vehicle to keep, uh, to keep traveling. We also have something called the Pirelli noise canceling system. This is a noise canceling uh, material that's within the tire that reduces the uh, road noise from the tire. And then we have something called cyber tires. These are electronics within the tire that then communicate with the vehicle uh, while it's being driven. Uh, discussing our factories uh, here in the NAFTA region, like I said, we have a factory in Rome, Georgia. This is uh, one of our smaller factories. It produces around 400,000 tires a year. It's a high-mix, low-volume factory focused on the premium uh, OE market. We also have a factory in Silao, Mexico. This was built in 2012. Uh, it's approaching uh, 5 million units of capacity. Most of this production in this factory is geared for the, uh, the NAFTA market. So, why are we here in Georgia? Um, first of all, this is, we're close to our customers, both the consumers and to the original equipment factories, BMW, Mercedes. It's also a very beneficial uh, labor environment for us. Uh, we have a great transportation infrastructure here, whether it's uh, the ports in Savannah, uh, whether it's the interstate system, uh, the rail network, and then of course, uh, the Atlanta airport that has passenger and cargo connections around the world. Plus, there's plenty of land available for future expansion of uh, factories and uh, warehousing. 
Our Mexico factory, we've just announced that we will be doubling the size of this factory. This will be a total of $600 million of investment. Uh, this will allow us to produce close to uh, more than uh, 7 million tires uh, by the end of 2018. And most of this production will again remain in the NAFTA region, and 30% um, of that will stay within the country of Mexico. So why did we build a Mexico factory? Um, we were in a region that was growing. We needed more and more tires. We were importing tires from very far overseas, lo overseas locations like Brazil, Romania, China. So if we were going to grow in this market, we had to have more production uh, capacity here in the NAFTA region. Um, to supply correctly the market uh, here in NAFTA, you have to have uh, stock. If you're supplying from China, from Brazil, that means that you would have to have a lot of stock uh, on the water and safety stock in your warehouses here. So by opening a factory in Mexico, we were able to decrease our cycle stock and decrease the amount of safety stock that we have to carry. We also have uh, seen a lot of cost savings on the logistics side, both in terms of international transportation costs and the ability to do direct deliveries to some of our customers uh, in the US. We also have a lot of flexibility to serve our market, uh, both in terms of volume and uh, product mix. So where in the past we had a lot of what we call make to stock uh, production, now we're doing a lot of make to order production directly from our factory uh, in Mexico. Our product mix is more dedicated to the NAFTA market, uh, where you have a lot more light trucks and SUVs than you would have in, say, Europe or South America. Plus, here in the US market, uh, the all-season tire is preferred to, say, the summer tire. And, of course, being in NAFTA, we don't have to pay customs duties. And uh, when we're competing with tires coming out of China, we are not having to pay the uh, import tariffs that are specifically on Chinese-produced uh, tires. So, like I said, um, our factory is in Silao, which is outside uh, Mexico City. Um, we're shipping a lot of tires into the U.S. and into Canada. When we built the factory, we were expecting that most of it was going to be traveling intermodal, and that's still my goal. And in the beginning, it was that way. But right now, because of so much demand for our product, uh, we're having to ship 80% of our production via truck uh, into the U.S., and we're trying to reverse this trend. So we have two warehouses in the U.S., one in Rialto, California, one in McDonough, Georgia. And then we have two warehouses in Canada, one in Vancouver and one in Mississauga, Ontario. Um, the two U.S. warehouses are operated by our 3PL, uh, Kuhn and Nagel. The two Canadian warehouses are operated by uh, D.B. Schinker. Um, these four warehouses are supplying uh, to our replacement or aftermarket customers, and then the McDonough warehouse and the Mississauga warehouse are supplying to our original equipment customers in the U.S. and Canada, respectively. We also do a lot of uh, shipments direct from Silao uh, into the U.S., both for replacement and for original equipment. Um, our our uh, warehouse in Silao there at the factory is operated by Kuhn and Nagel, and then we have a smaller warehouse just to serve the Mexico City market uh, run by a local 3PL. So something about our original equipment, uh, like I said, uh, being a European company uh, with all that heritage, um, a lot of our, um, uh, our original equipment customers are European car manufacturers. Then we have those European car manufacturers that are in the NAFTA region in addition to the traditional uh, American car manufacturers. So just uh, show you some of our fitments. Uh, we have a lot of fitments with Ford. Also, uh, with Fiat Chrysler, Dodge, uh, Jeep fitments, uh, we're supplying to BMW, we're supplying to Mercedes, Volkswagen, and also to Tesla. Just showing you the complexity of our inbound supply chain uh, with our production that's uh, in Mexico, we're still having to bring in lots of raw materials from overseas. Um, from China, we're bringing in silica, India, textile, Russia, synthetic rubber, uh, Turkey, we bring in steel cord. So these have very long lead times and we have to plan um, these lead times into our production. 
In terms of what we're distributing finished products um, uh, in North America, uh, we have all this production in Mexico and in the United States, but then we still have to import a lot of finished goods. Uh, Brazil is supplying uh, almost a third, and then countries like Germany, Romania are also significant suppliers to us. In terms of the differences between our businesses, I mean, we have uh, the two main channels, original equipment and replacement. We're still making a tire, it's black, it's round, but the way you manage it in the different uh, channels can be quite different. First of all, in original equipment, we have one customer per SKU, whereas in the replacement channel, you're making a tire and it can be sold to anybody in that channel. Uh, the product, um, in the original equipment market, you're making a specific size that's homologated to a specific vehicle um, uh, deemed by your, uh, your original equipment customer. Whereas in the replacement channel, it's much more complex. You have different product lines. You have, uh, you're making replacement tires for original equipment fitment. You're making pure replacement uh, tires. You're also maybe making a specific line dedicated to one customer. In terms of the manufacturing, um, Typically, you've homologated a certain size for a certain customer in a specific factory, whereas on the replacement side, you can make those replacement tires in any factory that's technically capable of making the tire. Uh, in terms of the demand planning on the original equipment side, it's a little more, uh, it, it, it's easier in the sense that you're just getting a customer forecast of their vehicle production, it's a rolling forecast, and you're manufacturing to that forecast. On the replacement side, you have many customers. Some of them are giving you a forecast, some of them are not. Some of them are just doing spot buys. Maybe you're running a promotion. You don't know how, how much you're going to have to make for that promotion. Then you also have seasonal products. These add a lot of complexity to the demand planning side of the business. In terms of the warehousing, we typically store, like I said, uh, the replacement and the OE tires together in the same warehouse, but the storage can be a bit different. You're doing a lot of bulk storage on the original equipment side, but then maybe you're having to use special racks that are required by the customer. You're having to put certain labels or placards on those uh, uh, pallets. Uh, you're having to track different conicities, markings, and uh, the DOT age of the tire. Whereas on the replacement side, you have bulk storage, but then you might have a lot of C and D items that require a single pallet uh, low density storage. In terms of the transportation side, Generally, original equipment is all full truckload business, but then it's always time critical just in time. Whereas on the replacement side, you could be shipping 1,000 tires or you could be shipping one tire. So the mode can be very different. You might be shipping via ocean container, full truckload, all the way down to LTL and parcel at a much higher cost. And then on the original equipment side of the business, you have uh, your consignees are typically the auto plant, or maybe it's a sequencer, or maybe it's a fitter. You're having to work with them. On the replacement side of the business, you're shipping to a customer's cross dock, their warehouse, or maybe even their retail store. In terms of the challenges that we're currently facing, some of the solutions that we've come up with to manage, I mean, it can be a very complex business. So, I mean, first of all, we're trying to keep up with our, our, uh, our growing business here in the NAFTA region. Uh, we're in the process of doubling the size of our Mexico factory, but uh, I mean, uh, adding manufacturing capacity takes time, so we're trying to keep up with the, the demand that we're seeing in our market. We've also been faced sometimes with low availability, low customer fill rates. Um, so we've been working with certain key customers, our larger replacement customers, to give us a rolling forecast uh, up to 90 days out. So we can do a lot of make-to-order production so that we can guarantee a certain supply to those key customers. On the transportation side, uh, having enough trucks, finding drivers for those trucks. These are things that are very, uh, I mean, uh, it's something we talk about in the industry that there's, there's, there's a lack of uh, truck drivers. So when we can use intermodal, we try to do that. Anything where you can separate having to have one truck, one container with one driver. Uh, intermodal, uh, we try to use it as much as we can because it allows us to have truck capacity for more critical parts of the business. Um, we're selling more and more directly to retailers, to clubs, 
These types of customers on the replacement side of our business require smaller, more frequent uh, deliveries. So one thing we're doing this year is we're going to be opening a new warehouse up in the northeast part of the United States. It'll be open by the end of the year. This will allow us to better serve uh, a key part of our market. Um, we try to do a lot of direct deliveries, both out of Mexico and from overseas. But when you're doing a direct delivery to a customer, um, it's a sea container coming in. So uh, we're trying to avoid having to touch it in our distribution network if we can. So we try to use sometimes the customer's uh, warehouse network to distribute the product for us. In terms of shipments uh, coming out of Mexico, we do a lot of direct uh, shipments to our original equipment customers. But these have to be on time. Um, a car cannot come off the production line if it doesn't have tires. So we have just-in-time shipments uh, coming into the United States. There's a lot of complexity uh, crossing uh, the U.S.-Mexico border. You can have uh, several different trucking companies, a Dre company, two customs brokers, a 3PL. You have a lot of parties involved with the shipment of, of one truck uh, coming from Mexico into the U.S. So you have to have team drivers sometimes. You have to have specialized carriers that are uh, unique to this part of the business. And then you have warehouses that are very busy. Um, you have full containers coming in. You have full trucks going out. You have empties to manage. Managing the yard for our warehouses is, is, is a key process. And how do we do this? We use preferred Dre carriers. We just don't use any carrier that's out there. We do drop and hook programs. We, we operate uh, 24 hours a day. These are the things to always keep the containers flowing and uh, so that we're not missing out on uh, available product. And lastly, I mean, I think one of the, the big challenges, and I think other people have mentioned it, is people. Uh, if you don't have uh, experienced, knowledgeable uh, people uh, in your company or with your 3PLs, uh, you're going to suffer. So trying to retain people in your organization is key. In addition, providing lots of training so that these people can be ret retained um, in the organization and uh, provide you the uh, expertise and the experience required to manage your business. So thanks again for your time, and I look forward to your questions uh, later on. Thanks. That's great, John. Thank you very much, John. Uh, Great presentation again, uh, sharing your network with us and helping us understand some of the challenges and, and solutions that you do and, and how perhaps many of the people in this room can also help you and support you. Next up, to hear a service provider's perspective to understand what, uh, what the role of container management and logistics can play uh, in the supply supply chain, I'd like to welcome to the podium Chris Buchanan, the sales director for Chet. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I have one major goal right now, is to get through this presentation as fast as possible. Uh, we had a great evening last night, and I think we're all ready to get over to lunch and uh, help us with that evening last night. A uh, couple of things that I've been hearing so far in these past two days are what are ways we can reduce complexity? The other thing is, is where there's definite a need to implement standardization. So what I'm gonna do today is give you some uh, ideas on hopefully to help with that. What I'm gonna go over in the next 10 minutes, again, I'm gonna be quick with this so we can uh, address anything that I miss later with questions, is show you why we feel the supply chain is so complex. The role packaging plays in that complexity the importance of packaging besides the obvious, of course, and how can we simplify it? So what makes the inbound, what makes the inbound supply chain challenging? There are many answers to this question, so let's take a look. Now when we look at this slide, and people that don't deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis are gonna say that's easy, right? We make the part, we package a part, we ship the part, should be easy. But I think everyone in this room knows that it's not that easy. Uh, in my last tier one job that I had, we took an injection molded part from Wisconsin. We shipped it to Michigan, had it painted in Michigan, shipped it down to Tennessee to be assembled, and then shipped it back up to Michigan to be finally put in the car. Um, 
The one thing I think we all can agree on is that our supply chain is not linear. So let's start to take a look at these layers of complexity and where they come from. I think John mentioned it already when he talked about the inbound raw materials that his company is dealing with. And Paolo and Matt both touched on it when they talked about the leather, vinyl, and trim suppliers and the complexity that's done in there. So when we talk about the layers of complexity, let's talk about the flows. And like I said, with those two examples and what we've heard over the past two days, you have flows coming in from Asia, you have flows coming in um, from Europe, from Mexico into the US and vice versa. Uh, Wendy from FCA mentioned yesterday, there's a sourcing strategy. These OEMs don't want a multiple tool in multiple locations. And it's a good strategy. Let's tool in one location globally and we'll ship that part wherever it needs to be. And it's something that they're uh, moving forward with. So what role does packaging play? As we continue in our layers of complexity, again, you say, Chris, this is Captain Obvious right here. It's super easy. We've got truck, boat, and rail. What's so complex about that? But in, in, within these three modes, there's additional modes within them. So again, still not that complex, Chris. Where's complexity? But the reality is, is within those modes, you have multiple options for packaging that builds on the complexity change. And last in our last layer in our complexity change is the part itself. Oops. A little too fast there. I guess I'm really hungry, sorry about that. <laughs> um, we want to, what are we doing with the packaging to minimize the damage risk? Uh, what's the weight of it? What are our requirements there? What's the shape? Is it odd or standard? Uh, what's our pack density? Are the parts electrical in nature? Do we need special ESD uh, protection? Do we need to keep it safe from moisture or contamination? And lastly, how is it being handled at the line? Is it just in time, just in sequence, and so forth? So the importance of packaging. Again, packaging is more than just the price of the box. Again, I think we can all agree on that here. But what we found is that there's six major components that factor in the packaging cost. One is the obvious, the price of the returnable or pooling packaging. Next is, are we taking into account the optimization of our modes of transportation, whether it be truck, rail, or boat? How much protection does our packaging need to get through those modes? And looking at packaging, are we limiting the amount of times that part or packaging is handled through that supply chain? At the, and then how is it being used at the end of line? Do we need extra storage space at the line or in the uh, warehouses? And then finally, is our packaging sustainable? So in my 20 years, I've been a tier one supplier, and it's been my norm that packaging has always been an afterthought. Let's win the business, and then we'll figure out how we get it to the OEM. Now, I'm not saying that's everyone's norm, but again, I've been with several different companies, and it's been our norm. And what that is, is it drives the wrong behavior, and there's hidden cost. Here's an exact example of what we did with a certain customer of ours, and they said, here, here's our cost. Analyze it for us. And we did. And we showed, you know what? When we looked at your total cost of ownership, there was only 20% that you budgeted. You missed part damage, transportation utilization, excessive handling, and so forth. So let me walk you through a quick example. Right. What we have here is a one-way um, package example to an OEM via a repack facility. So first, again, is the obvious. You have the cash outlay for the one-way packaging from the supplier. Next is the risk of damage due to the robustness of that one-way packaging. Is our truck that we hired to take this packaging fully utilized? The parts are unpacked from the truck in the repack facility, so it's the first time they're handled. They need to be stored in that repack facility. And then in parallel, the OEM has went out and bought a returnable container that they want to use it in or, uh, right at the line. So with doing that, they're going to need people and systems to maintain that uh, returnable packaging. That returnable packaging is going to be or have to be maintained. 
those empties need to be trucked back to that repack facility. The parts themselves are going to have to be packed back into the returnable, so that's the second handling. The one-way packaging, when that's complete, needs to be disposed of. And then finally, that returnable packaging at some point is going to have to be scrapped or recycled. So what can I leave you with today that can help you into this complexity? Standardization. We've heard it over the past two days. We are looking for this in our industry. We don't have it today. So if we could limit the number of sizes to, optimi to optimize our transport uh, modes, we would help simplify the supplier supply chain. So what would that look like? One way is what we call pooling or sharing of assets. This allows multiple suppliers and tiers to share standard containers to reduce the complexity. Next, I'd like to just show you kind of a quick analogy of what I'm talking about when we talk about shared. I think we all know what Uber is and how it works. You don't have to own your car. You don't have to maintain it. If you live in a really dense city, you don't have to look or find parking. You don't have to pay for the parking. The pooling philosophy is a lot like that in the same way, as you don't have that initial outlay of uh, one-way packaging or returnable packaging, the capital. Um, you don't have to maintain that returnable packaging. Uh, you don't have a place to store it. You don't have to find a place to remove it if it's one-way packaging. Uh, what this does is it takes one of those pieces of the complexity chain out. So, I think I'm doing okay. I did this as fast as I could, and I just want to close with one last page here. So in our current environment, a lot is being pushed into the supplier supply chain. And I think from my experience over the past 20 years, the suppliers have done an excellent job of pulling all that cost out to give the optimal product to the OEM. But if I could just give you one more tool in your toolbox to help you simplify the complexity, um, improve the quality, um, and reduce your cost, I think the more we can do this further upstream will help the total cost of ownership be reduced for the end customer and really find a solution that's a win-win in our industry today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, and showing some possible solutions uh, to help them make the supply chain more efficient and perhaps some cost savings as well. So now it's uh, time for, uh, to open it up to you for the, for the Q&A. This is particularly focused on the supply supply chain, uh, the relationship between the, the OEM and the suppliers, uh, the length of the supply chains, I guess. So. Again, the first option is for you guys, if anyone's got a question or a comment to make, if you can raise your hand, wait for the microphone uh, and, ask the, and ask the question. And again, as Chris has often said in the past, don't think you're, by not asking a question, you're getting out to lunch earlier. So I've got about 500, 500 questions and I'm on a diet, so I'm trying to skip lunch anyway. So, <laughs> first question from my side. Um, what about the, perhaps for, for Volkswagen and, uh, and then the others, is uh, communication down the supply chain? You know, to the, tier one and tier two is probably relatively easy, but what happens when you start and get into the tier threes and tier fours? You said you, you can arrange phone calls and try and communicate. Is the communication system becoming more efficient? Is there still Excel sheets? Is there still faxes and telexes and carrier pigeons or whatever it is that people use now? Or is it all super efficient and everyone's on the cloud because everyone's got iPhones and, and whatever it is? So Paolo first, maybe. Well, um, although uh, there are a lot of uh, new systems out there, there is still a state-of-the-art system that I think everybody uses, and it's called Excel 2010. <laughs> <laughs> um, in fact, uh, when we um, have to deal 
especially with significant uh, difference of uh, time schedules. If we want to make a, a call together with Argentina, with Mexico and uh, US Central at the same time, it can become a challenge, yes. But uh, I think we have managed up so far to do a good job, correct, in some of the critical situations. I want to re-emphasize that um, the first years are completely autonomous. They are not mandated by the OEMs to um, how to, to run their own business. But again, uh, it's our role, our responsibility to support into the last row of the, of the chain. So um, it's a risk management, as I refer, that mm -hmm. gives some work, but so far has been paying off. Mm -hmm. And so Adam, you you work with the, the tier twos and threes, and you can be honest, uh, Paolo's gonna cover his ears for a few <laughs> moments, he won't hear what you're saying. Yes, I, I agree with Paolo that it, it, it has become more easy to communicate with the uh, tier two and tier threes. Um, like he said, even though we are 100% directed by VW of who we purchase from, that still doesn't keep us from being autonomous. Um, I'm still required to manage my supply base. I'm required to have those conversations with them prior to having the conversation with VW. If it's necessary that it needs to be escalated, that's when I escalate. Um, I'll throw out a uh, comment that Paulo made before, a little quote that he told me one time, uh, don't let me know when child is dead. I was very, uh, first time I heard that, I was like, hmm, that's kind of, uh, kind of brunt and uh, honest there, brutally honest, as he said before. But then I started thinking about it, and it's just like if your child is sick, right, what are you going to do? You're going to talk to people. You're going to go to the doctor. You're going to try to find out and communicate what is going on. So I, I keep my Apollo comments on my board mm -hmm. so that I always remember them. And... Uh, Definitely don't wait to the last minute to talk about a problem. Mm -hmm. The logistics industry is quite a brutal industry, isn't it? <laughs> you know, kill the naysayers. You know, don't, don't fire them. Kill the namesayers. You know, treat an emergency as if they're done something when the child is dead. But sorry, you're going to follow up. Yeah, we, we keep the fill the fill up the fibrillators. What's the name of that the thing? Yes, that's yes. clear. Yeah. Just for fibrillators. In case. Uh, <laughs> If, if you are bringing in as a problem when your supply chain is completely disrupted already, there's nothing that you can do. You can dump how much money you want in air charters or whatever um, that you will not avoid to stop the line. So it's our main responsibility to, to keep production running. And uh, we will fight for it because that's our main goal, right? So. Uh, we need to, to know in advance whenever there are disruptions. And again, this is a cultural thing. And I think we have done a good job. In and John? Yeah, I mean, I think there's still a lot of uh, Excel sheets going around, but certainly using ER, MRP systems, this has reduced the amount of uh, the need for that, reduced the amount of errors. Uh, fortunately, in our industry, um, a lot of our changes in production are around what we call the size the size mix. So we're using the same compounds, we're just changing out the sizes so it's a different mold. So uh, the, let's just say the raw material inbound is relatively stable. Our supplier pool is relatively stable. We're not changing those uh, very frequently. So it's less of an effect for us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any yep. questions? Not yet. Um, what about, we were in Atlanta, we're in Georgia, so I was just gonna ask perhaps a Paolo, uh, and Adam again about uh, what's what's it um, what are the advantages transportation advantages difficulties what's what's good what's different about being down south down here as opposed to you know with the the industry being based out uh, the rest of the rest of the U S I guess what are the advantages of uh, that you found from being down here well I thought that uh, we were very angry and we wanted to go to have lunch sooner but. Uh, <laughs> That's, that's really a tricky question. Um, mm -hmm. We have a very good partnership with the Port of Savannah. We have been treated with exceptional, uh, I would say, 
performance. Um, so uh, on that side, on the Seafright side, I think we, we have a very good relationship uh, with them. Uh, we also have a very good relationship with our over-the-road uh, transport carriers. I mentioned before Ryder, but we developed a local supplier called Tranco, and also the group Sese, which is our partner in other plants in the world. But where we really struggle, to be honest, is on the intermodal um, transport. Because you would think that um, Considering that you have longer lead times, uh, you will have, I would say, a, a very competitive economical advantage. And that being intermodal, you, would have, you should have also some flexibility, some agility. But the fact is, uh, we see this um, flow extremely congested. And although uh, there's been an effort to increase the number of lanes and av availability, um, we, we do, um, had to put aside for now this specific uh, intermodal concept. So overall, the location here on the south is, is very good, transport-wise, and we, didn't, we do not feel any kind of constraints currently. Mm -hmm. John? Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, the Port of Savannah is uh, critical to our business, uh, coupled with uh, the Port of Charleston. Um, we have really good service out of there, a container gets unloaded and it can be in our warehouse uh, in McDonough in a day. Um, you know, intermodal, is, it can be a challenge, um, especially for us going from Mexico to Canada. It seems like containers get stopped in Chicago and that's, that's always a mess. Um, the intermodal flow from Mexico into Georgia is good, but uh, really going into uh, um, Canada uh, can be complex. And a question for Chris, really, on, uh, on the pooling and packaging side. When I think of CHEP, I must admit, in my mind, I think of you guys working with and for OEMs. Uh, do you, can you offer your solution specifically for, for tier suppliers? Um, yes, actually, I go back to the first question you asked, and you asked mm. about how do you do collab, or you know, how do we get to the tier twos, tier threes, mm. and we do that. And the thing is, um, what they talked about earlier, and the collaboration, and if you can work further upstream with your tier twos, tier twos and tier threes, uh, with your packaging um, pooling ideas, um, it's a great stream. It's a great way to get the complexity out of the system. So yeah, we're, we're working with tier ones, tier twos, and the flows coming into them and the flows going to the uh, OEMs. And that's a good point about collaboration. Or one of the things that's come out from this conference for me a little bit is culture, the challenge or the way we have to change our culture in the automotive and automotive logistics industry. So one of the good things about your presentation, Paolo uh, and Adam, was that there seemed to be a real partnership there. Is that, you know, is that a real change that you can see uh, in the automotive industry? Is it something that's specifically here that for a variety of reasons you've been able to do in, in Chattanooga that maybe it's harder to do elsewhere? What enabled you to have this, what seems to be uh, a real partnership? A lot of people like to talk about this. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about collaboration, yes, it's, I would say, very used uh, term, but in the end, in the daily business is where you have really to feel it. And I'm not, think, I'm not only specifically speaking about the collaboration between suppliers or first years, second years, first, first years, but for instance, with the free PLs, there's a lot of them here on the room, right? And uh, when we talk about collaboration, uh, if we really believe in partnership, this has to be a two-way. Mm -hmm. And at Volkswagen, we try to uh, stimulate and to create the conditions for this collaboration to be active. Because in the end of the day, if this happens, it can save thousands of dollars um, for both entities. Yeah, I agree that, uh, yeah, we've had to work through several situations, like Paulo mentioned, with 3PL providers to where um, we chose to try to uh, save a little money and uh, go with a different provider, which in turn started impacting our our production facility, which in turn was going to impact VW, and we had to collaborate to 
collaboratively work together to come up with a new provider that would uh, benefit both of us. Um, Volkswagen shared the, uh, the resources that they were using and allowed us to work with them to quote on our business. So it wasn't a, uh, you have to use these people or anything like that, but it was shared. Say, hey, look at these people. Uh, they may can help you, at least in the interim. And they did. And then we were able to uh, ultimately find a good carrier. And so, yeah, the cooperation there is key. Yeah, but what's the worst thing about working with Paolo? You don't have to answer this one. Well. I, I plead the fifth. But we've only got 20 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> 20 minutes. <laughs> He has a scorecard. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. John, have you, uh, are you big able to develop these kind of partnerships with Pirelli and both upwards to your customers and downwards to your suppliers and even LSPs? Um, you know, when you talk about a 3PL, if you consider them just a supplier, then that relationship is only as long as the contract that you signed or the, the length of the transaction that they're currently performing. When you view them as a partner, uh, it's a much more stable environment for both parties. Um, you know, a logistics service provider, you can't rebid some of these things every single year if you're talking about a warehouse or some specialized services. So really, I mean, you have to work with them as a partner and, uh, you know, especially if investments are required on their part, you know, this has to be something that's longer term than necessarily just the length of the contract that's been signed. Question from this side. Matthew Brownlow with Nissan Logistics Strategy. Uh, this question's for Mr. Godfrey. I know with your prod, uh, with your product, there's a few different um, packing strategies between bundled, loose lace, um, or stovepipe. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit in regards to what you're seeing out of the industry, what what your customers' preference are, and why. Um, so first of all. Um Let's just uh, start with the replacement market. Um, generally, these tires are uh, full truckload or LTL. They're going to be laced. So if somebody doesn't know what that means, it's not stacking the tires like donuts. It's putting them in a weave pattern that actually gives you a higher saturation in the truck and keeps the tires from moving around. That's the preference. The, the tires are not uh, uh, affected in any way during the short transit time. Um, for something that's more ultra high performance or if it's going to be in transit for a very long distance, say around the world, then we'll be stove piping it. Uh, in the original equipment channel, uh, really our customers dictate how they want the tires coming in. Some of them want them stove piped, some of them want them uh, 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 loose laced like you described. And then in special uh, cases, we have either palletized freight uh, with a, um, you know, a wooden pallet or sometimes uh, in the past, we've used uh, stackable steel racks to transport the tires in. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? I really don't want to finish early because uh, I think Paolo, like myself, needs to really work on that diet. So we don't want to start lunch too early. But, uh, but I think we'll, we'll, uh, we'll call it a... Uh, Call it an end to the session there. Thank you very much to the panel for giving us such interesting and detailed information on what they're doing. So thank you very much. We're still only halfway through the day here, so um, we've got the, the think tanks which are coming up just after, just after lunch, uh, and the final panel with, uh, like, which I said before, with Honda, Volkswagen, Fiat Chrysler, Ford, and Ryder. So we've got a great afternoon still to come so don't plan on leaving early uh, enjoy your lunch and be back for the think tanks uh, we'll list some of the think tanks up there to give you an idea of what they are and you can help choose in advance but please join us for them they really are one of the highlights of the conference thank you very much